So it's 940, so in the interest of keeping to time, which is what the session is all about, I will get started. Welcome to Stopwatch Session 5. My name is Katherine Heilman. I am the e-resources librarian at UNC Greensboro, which has very little relevance to anything in this session, but I thought I would mention it. So welcome everybody. We have a great group of speakers. Stopwatch sessions are excellent because you get to learn a lot in a short amount of time, and I think we can all appreciate the efficiency in that. So um, I'm going to sit up front and I'll give a little wave when we're at one minute for each speaker and then after let's hold questions until everybody has gone and then I will come around with a microphone and maybe our speakers could come up here and speak in here and that way everybody's voice gets captured um, for the recording. So I would like to introduce Yolanda Tugwell and Carly Nelson um, with, our first, with our first session. Mm -hmm. Hi, good morning. So, um, welcome to our session, e-resources at your fingertips. Um, I'm Yolanda Tugwell. I am a librarian in the uh, Information Literacy Unit at the University of the West Indies, Mona, in Kingston, Jamaica. With me is my colleague, Carly Nelson, and she is a cataloging librarian at the University of the West Indies, Mona. And I am going to hand over to Mrs. Nelson. So, as you heard, we are from the University of the West Indies in Kingston, Jamaica. <coughs> and our campus is one of the five UWI campuses in the Caribbean. The enrollment at our campus is about, is approximately 19,000 students. The Yubi Mona libraries consist of one main library and four branch libraries. There are 25 librarians employed at our library. 80% of our annual library budget is spent on e-resources. So as the saying goes, we can't rely on the notion that if we buy it, they will use it. So we have to find creative ways to make our faculty and students aware of the electronic resources that are available. So an electronic fair is one of the ways that we use to promote our e-resources. The e-resources fair was conceptualized by our medical librarian and it started in our medical library. It was later incorporated into our annual open week events in 2015. The fair was held virtually in 2020 and in 2021. A group of four librarians planned and executed the event. The theme for the fair was resources at your fingertips. The fair was held via Zoom and Google Forms was used to capture the participant feedback. So Yolanda will now continue with the rest of the presentation. So for promotion and marketing, um, we had ads on the library's website and on the library's social media pages. We sent out emails to the heads of departments, the faculty, administrative assistants, and course students and faculty to attend the fair. And emails were delivered to the UWI community through the Mona Messaging, which is their email service to the community. Um, so this is what our flyer looks like at the top left-hand corner. And um, you can actually see it on YouTube. So there's a QR code there. And the presentations were made by two major vendors, EBSCO and ProQuest. And they gave $50 USD Amazon gift cards, um, four of them. And there was an overview of other databases and e-resources available based on the faculties that we have. And we also had a tutorial on the web version of EndNote, uh, which we have in Note 20. And we did a tutorial on Ulink, which is the library's online portal, um, the catalog and how you get to all the resources. And we had an online timed quiz on Kahoot for participation um, by the audience. 
Um, for the assessment, feedback was received from an online survey. Approximately 30% of the attendees responded. Um, respondents found the fair useful. Some are not aware of all the databases related to their discipline, and some indicate that they'll be using a new resource. Um, in the Zoom chat itself, we have participated participants expressing gratitude, and one person asked if they had to pay. We had comparison of EBSCO and ProQuest databases in terms of the increase over the two years. And in conclusion, the fair was successful. Although we would have wanted more attendees, the online audience enthusiastically engaged with presenters and with incentives gave added appeal. Um, it was cost effective because there was no venue set up, ordering of food and other details were illuminated. And it promoted the library resources and created awareness. Overall, we thought this was satisfying to attendees. And here's our contact information. And thank you. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Courtney McAllister. I am a library services engineer at EBSCO. And today I wanted to talk very briefly about how we update change communication for working in hybrid workplaces, which is a scintillating topic. I'm sure everyone's on the edge of their seats. Um, so a few years ago, uh, before the pandemic, um, I wrote a book on change management for library technologists. And one of the, the through lines uh, for me, the real takeaways, as I was doing that research was how crucial communication is at every stage of the change process. Uh, whether you're implementing a new system, doing a library reorganization or renovation, how you communicate at the outset, the duration and afterwards can really set, um, set you up for success or some, some rocky road. Um, so when people were primarily working together in shared spaces, we, we cultivated some techniques for communication um, when you're getting ready to embark on a new endeavor, right? you typically bring everyone together for a brainstorming session. We're all in the room. Everyone's ideating. Maybe there are post-its involved. Hopefully there's candy. Um, you know, when you check in, you have those opportunities to have regular meetings, but then also informal check-ins, stopping by somebody's cubicle to ask about, oh, how did you, how did you feel about XYZ? Or what do you think this next phase is going to be like? There were lots of ways that we communicated with each other when we were all working together in a, in a space. With the sudden shift to virtual, a lot of those techniques got adapted. And I'm not saying virtual is lesser or better, just different. Um, so instead of those brainstorming sessions, right, we had a lot of surveys to gather feedback and gain momentum for change. Um, a lot of update communication came in the form of posts on Teams or Slack, and then gauging responses kind of relied on thumbs up or gifts or how people are reacting to those kinds of communications. Um, so there was a definite change there in how we talk about change. Now we're in this hybrid environment where a lot of your colleagues, a lot of your personnel may be primarily on site, primarily off site, or operating between the two. Um, so there are a lot of different ways that people are getting information about change and communicating about change. So I think we might need to revisit some of the ways we talk uh, about change and work with each other when we are um, embracing something new or trying something different. Um, I have a couple of suggestions just to kind of get the conversation started. Um, by no means and all be all kinds of comments, but just based on my experiences and my research, some things I think may be worth considering. As we cultivate better communication in the hybrid world, I think if you're having a high impact meeting, and not everyone can be on site together, make it virtual. I'm probably not the only one who has participated in a meeting where you had your kind of like faction in the physical space with their side conversations and their rapport, and then people joining from Zoom or Teams. And there can be a little bit of a hierarchy in terms of who really gets to kind of lead the discussion or participate fully. So for the sake of equity and fairness, I would say level that playing field and do virtual meetings for those really significant high impact uh, sessions. If you are doing some change communication via Slack or Teams, um, I would try introducing a reaction key to get a little more insight into how people are responding to this information that you're sharing. 
Uh, people may naturally respond with a thumbs up to acknowledge a message, um, but if you could maybe encode that a little deeper um, to say, you know, if you feel great about this, respond this way. Because um, there are two, I think, key aspects of change communication, comprehension and emotion. Do people understand what's happening and how do they feel about what's happening? And this could be an opportunity to actually leverage some of our virtual tools to get some really quick insights into the temperature, the temperament of your, your colleagues or your staff. Um, along those lines, 2B, I didn't really think it was enough for a standalone point, but a sub point. Um, try to pay attention to those reactions or the lack thereof. If you held an all hands meeting and gave some updates on your latest system migration and nobody said anything, that would probably feel a little, a little uncomfortable. Um, similarly, if you're posting things and not getting any responses, that may also be a sign to pivot or do some more proactive communication. Reach out and see where people are with their tolerance for the change or their comfort with it. Um, because people are getting their information from different places in this hybrid environment, um, I would encourage the use of templates for your change communication to help ensure that people who are in the office are getting the same information as the people who are you know, operating primarily in virtual spaces or bouncing between, um, just to kind of keep people on the same footing. Um, and then if you are doing any kind of post-change assessment, I would definitely advocate for incorporating communication questions in that feedback. And also try to suss out where people are typically engaging with your communications. If they're looking at emails and getting in-person meetings, um, or looking at Slack or Teams or something of that nature. There's a lot we can say about how we talk about change, um, especially with the hybrid dynamics that we're all wrestling with now. Um, the Google Drive here has some templates for consideration as well as a document that anyone's welcome to contribute to. Um, it's editable, so if you have ideas or suggestions on how we can improve this process going forward, please feel free to pop those in. I also have a QR code, because those have made a comeback, which I did not have on my bingo card. Um, <laughs> so with that, I just wanted to say thank you very much, um, and happy to talk further if there's any interest. And slide credits, thank you. Hello, I'm Julia Gelfand, and I'm the Applied Sciences and Engineering Librarian at the UC Irvine's Libraries. I'm here today to talk about communicating transformative agreements and um, communicating to whom, what you're communicating, and um, how you do it. So um, that's been a big theme of this meeting um, already, and the background is accelerating quickly as transformative agreements mature into a staple of library and publisher relationships. This is a behind-the-scenes talk and peek at what transformative agreements, often known as transitional agreements or read and publish agreements or publish and read agreements, um, are and who needs to know about them. So defined as agreements between publishers and libraries where um, the subscription costs may dictate and or redefine what the new program is that allows for open access publishing of um, the content in those journals that recasts the business model of scholarly publishing uh, by bringing together the reading purpose and the access with the author payment charges or the APCs into a single negotiation. And that's usually handled at a pretty high up level within an institution. So there are lots of ways that this is um, handled, many flavors, so to speak, and um, details distinguish all the um, agreements. So fast-changing landscape at most institutions, and even though you might have multiple transformative agreements with different publishers, they're all going to be different and have different terms. So those are um, the background. So here's a list of what the, uh, my institution, one of ten campuses of the University of California, relies upon as guidance from the California Digital Library, our consortial um, umbrella, to negotiate on behalf of the entire consortium. Currently, we have agreements with this list of publishers, and it's um, quite dynamic and fluid and changes often. But the homework that goes on behind the scenes to compile such an agreement is notoriously laborious and um, pretty significant, as those of you who have been involved 
will recognize. So the big question, this is critical. Who is in the know and who needs to know? It may not determine where to publish, but it will probably potentially encourage our authors to be more aware of certain options, especially if they have a mandate to um, publish in the open access. And as the rules change for external funding, that's um, obviously driving a lot of this. So authors are the key people, um, and it may lead them to determine where best to publish um, their content. It doesn't suggest that a librarian is going to say, you know, these are your only options, because it's the author's determination of where they're going to um, rank their priorities. Librarians need to know, because they need to educate that scholarly community of um, people in the pipeline, new authors especially, how to understand payment options and um, how the logistics work. And it's going to work differently at every institution and in every kind of um, enterprise. So publishing community at large needs to compete for authors, so they need to create um, transformative agreements that resonate and are kind of easy to understand and that the people who are doing those negotiations can get through the pipeline quickly. And then the next generation, basically, of scholars, graduate students, and potential authors, they need to have that awareness that if they have externally funded research, they need to publish in an open access way. And there are, method, met, there are many different methods, but they need to um, think through that. And um, having a set of FAQs and some instruction and background from the live, hosting library or institution might be helpful. And I would assume this it's part of the repertoire of being educated about open access options. So some frequently asked questions, these are difficult to read, but how to basically um, they center around how to apply for funding in the publishing process. And sort of um, these are FAQs from my institution, but um, you know, it doesn't include everything, but it includes um, some key areas here. So are all publishers included? Absolutely not. But agreements um, currently in the UC program account for approximately 85% of published output, but not every publisher has funding support. And that's the biggest distinction to really make. And if someone has external funding, they're expected to um, build into their data management plan and into their costs and effectiveness uh, what they need to um, include for publishing charges and have those billed accordingly. And then the remainder of those fees are paid by this transformative agreement. So kind of, um, and again, it's not mandated that everybody has to um, pay, but if you have those um, criteria set up in your research funding, you must follow. So engaging in the communication process, this is sort of the meat of my pro, um, profile today, is um, mix the formal with personal opportunities to share those benefits. So people learn about the procedures and extend scholarly communication goals across your institution for open access, peer review process, um, citation metrics, things like that. And um, maybe you can serve as a personal concierge to scholars through this process. You might do it once, and then they might have a totally, in two years' time, a different um, journal and a different uh, publisher that they have the same questions about. So it's not that they were in a quick learn, but the situation is quite different. How do we communicate that? Maybe through departmental meetings or through new when new agreements are announced to make sure that they um, find out about that. And sort of you know, work with the reps and... Um, it's likely to be an ongoing process for some time. So that sort of summarizes the process, but I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Erica Barnett, and I'm the Acquisitions Librarian at Western Carolina University. And this is important to me because as I stepped into my role about two years ago, there wasn't much documentation or instructions left for me on how to do, do my job. And so I relied heavily on my colleagues with institutional memory to help me um, learn my position 
And so this has been something I've been working on uh, in my unit and department to kind of get us up and have our documentation ready. And so this is probably an ongoing important thing, just because I also read an article that one in five workers are likely to look for a new job in the next couple months. And so I think it's really important to stress our documentation and making sure it's good to go because it will support our new hires and help them feel confident in their roles and be successful with what they're supposed to do. There are several benefits other than onboarding and that are, um, it produces results that are high quality so there's no confusion about who's supposed to do what and how things are supposed to be done. It preserves the institutional knowledge so all the colleagues that I relied on, if they would have had written it on paper, I probably would have done a better job to learn my job quicker. And then also it increases the organizational transparency. So if there's somebody in another department that needs to jump in or want to learn more about our processes, they can do that easily. There are definitely challenges with documentation. One of them I am well aware of, and it's the amount of time that it takes to create documentation. When you are wearing multiple hats, meeting, having to meet deadlines, uh, answering questions often, <coughs> it is really challenging to set aside time to write a well-written document for others. There are some people who are knowledge workers, whether it's intentional or not. People just don't want to share information. Some people are self-conscious about what they're writing and how they're writing it, so it takes them a little bit more time to write a well-written document. And some people just don't know the point of it. It's all in their mind. They're not going anywhere, so it doesn't matter what they write because no one's going to look at it. So this is really important for my unit, and we all had individual goals to update our documentation as we are um, for our individual processes. And here recently it's become more of a departmental goal so that we all can cross-train and learn from one another. We created standards around our documentation, so instead of using names, we use position-based. We have a template that we use so that there's consistency among the documents. And then also we have a file naming structure so that there's consistency in how a document's being named. We do maintain it and review it often. It's a great summer project. There's also an Excel hack where you can export your files into um, an Excel document, and so it's easier for tracking to review who did what and if it needs to be updated. And then we're also moving into the mindset of documenting in the moment. So as those processes change, just go ahead and make a note to go ahead and do the documentation because if, if it's a process that you're working on that you don't have later on, I'm thinking like fiscal close where you only do that one time a year, having screenshots to, would be really difficult to do in August when you've already done the process. And then also if you do have older documentation, reuse that when possible so you're not having to create anything from scratch. Some other tips that I found helpful was uh, there was a webinar from the Calm Conference on technical writing, and that helps you uh, go through and write a document, you know, doing the documentation, um, and I've shared that on the last slide. Making sure you keep user experience in mind as well as getting feedback. Have somebody from another department follow your documentation to make sure that your outcome is the desired outcome, and if not, then kind of go back and make sure that you fine-tune it. And then lastly, share it. Some people, you know, if you win the lottery and you don't want to go back the next day, you have it somewhere where everybody can access it and you don't have to worry about thinking of work, you know, moving on. You can spend your money on your yachts, whatever. <laughs> um, and so here I have the, the Calm Conference webinar and then how to get that list of names from the file folders in Excel um, to hopefully motivate you to get your documentation updated. All right, now we have entered our Q&A portion. I'm going to walk around with the microphone, and um, I'm hoping for a lively discussion. So does anybody have any questions? And if y'all could answer up there, so I don't have to. Hi, my name is Rosemarie. I'm from the Chronicle of Higher Education. So my big question is, you know, outside of the fair, how you share about your e-resources, and this can be any librarian who just spoke, and how can publishers support that process?
Um, just to say that we, I'm going to try and take off my mask this time. Um, just to say that we, um, we have what are called liaison librarians. So apart from your work, um, it's not a separate job. Um, you do that in addition. So whatever your, your, your work is, you have a subject area that you are responsible for. For example, I'm responsible for engineering, which is totally out of my um, skill set. But anyhow, um, so we, we, we um, notify them of sessions and um, we share the resources with them. And if we have a vendor coming, usually when it was face-to-face, um, -face, the vendor would come and we'd have a session and we'd invite them. Also, we have had in previous times where we've had library open week face to face and invited them to like the faculty to a faculty conversation, you know, for them to talk about, um, you know, what they want and to have the vendor there and so on. Um, anything else, Mrs. Nelson? You can Oh yes, so, um, and I should know that. <laughs> in my unit um, for the which is a small unit, Mona Information Literacy Unit. We have information literacy sessions, and usually um, persons will ask us to have sessions. And uh, for example, Mrs. Nelson is the liaison for education, and she gets a lot of requests, right? And for her, um, it is going into the sessions into the, where you're going into the courses, so whether postgrad or undergrad, and actually sharing the resources with them from that point. So um, regularly we use EBSCO and ProQuest, which are pretty user friendly. And because a lot of them are beginner researchers, we tend to use those. Hi, uh, my question is for Julia. Hi, Julia. Uh, Maria Sao from the Clam Colleges. Um, we have way fewer transformative agreements than the new guys, and we already struggle how to organize the information so that it's not confusing for uh, faculty. So my question is, have you, ha, have you um, apart from FAQs, have you organized uh, the information in some ways, like they all, you know, what's common about them, what's, I'm, I'm looking for some kind of tips of how to help people navigate. Well, we've gone the FAQ route. However, there's a lot of um, variation. So the issue is, I think, it could be very helpful. My colleague is a um, in charge of um, the campus-wide effort to promote scholarly communications, um, sort of takes the lead in this, and he'll share the specifics about each of these rollouts, and um, then we kind of um, match it up with what the coverage of the content is, but if it's a large publisher such as Wiley or Taylor and Francis or Elsevier or something where it's multiple subject areas, you really have to do that several times, you know, stratify that information. So I think that's just helpful. I can't say we're mature enough in the communication process to say that we've adopted any of the ideas that you suggested, but I think it's um, getting near to the situation. And, of course, the contact that we have with most uh, researchers or faculty is my one favorite journal or the highest ranked one in my field isn't part of any of these processes and I still am committed to open access and I want to do it and how do I get my APCs paid for. And unfortunately they can't come get paid out of the funding that has been put aside for these transformative agreements. So that puts away money, and um, but I think it takes care of, um, it opens up every time we get these calls, we supposedly log them so we have a sense of demand. And um, it's the big packages that we're after now because it covers more journals. And then I think we're sort of reaching down to smaller ones um, and key ones for a specific campus. But my campus is really relying on the guidance of the consortia. So I think um, if the consortia was really well staffed, which it's not, we have some staffing gaps right now, maybe that would have been farther or more mature in the process. But I think we're getting there and recognize that it could be useful. 
I'm almost dreaming of some sort of interactive tool that faculty can follow to get to the to the question. Yeah. If I think need someone to create it. Right. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question for Erica. Um, I figure out how to articulate it. Did you encounter any pushback from colleagues about spending the time to create documentation that you so desired? And how did that all work out? And have you had the opportunity to um, have a new person come on board to experience you know, all of your documentation? So we've had a lot of new employees. Uh, the technical services that I was in a couple years ago is not the same what it is now. And so I think having so many new people who have been looking for documentation, they are really on board because they see the benefits of it right then and there. And uh, when I vacated my role, I had not done documentation. And so I spent a lot of time training my new hire and spending time with one-on-one -on -one showing them how to do things. And it would have been a little bit easier if I had done documentation and they could have followed that and asked questions. So it's really been helpful that everybody's been on board. It's an ongoing process to still do documentation. It's constant gardening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do we have any more questions? I actually have a question um, for Courtney. Uh, I am a hybrid worker myself, so sometimes I love to attend the virtual meetings and sometimes there are meetings. And I've heard this concept of if not everybody can be there, let's have it virtual. I still feel like there's a lot of tension around that idea of actually mm -hmm. making that because there, there are people who really value that in-person contact. So I would just wonder if you could speak a little about that kind of tension. Yeah, that, that's a really good observation, and I think that's a tension we're going to have for a little while to come. Um, I would say that just framing it around equity, making sure everyone has the opportunity to really engage in the conversation is, you know, the, the honest framing for it. And, I mean, when, when you do join a meeting virtually and everyone else is in the room, I mean, it, it feels a little bit like you're secondary, at least in my opinion. I don't know if that resonates for you. Um, but yeah, I would keep it framed around equity and we're just going to have to adapt as this continues to be a part of our work culture, I think. Are there any more questions? No? Okay. Well, thank you for coming to our session. I really greatly enjoyed all that you offered today and um, there will be an opportunity for these sessions to be in the virtual week and if you um, want to engage in the conversation then there'll be a different way to do that via Zoom. So thank you for coming today and enjoy the rest of your conference.